Right, let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to the dark days when you were a wee lad. What kind of stuff were you reading? How did you get into science fiction, fantasy, horror, all of that kind of stuff? Uh, my dad. My dad was... Um, uh, uh, you know, my dad loved... Uh, he's, he, my dad's a real... I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. And, Little Rock, and Arkansas is a, has a population of 2 million. It's, it's not... Uh, I, I was born in 1971, like... Let's, let's do some David Copperfield crap. I, I was born in 1971 in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I grew up in Little Rock. You know, I came of age in the 80s in Arkansas, and it's like uh, we always call it bumfuck Egypt. I mean, we it's like um, we are. <laughs> you, you know, I, I had a I had a very interesting childhood, and I had a very interesting dad and, and mom. But my dad was quirky in the sense that he was a reader. He was a big reader. He was a lawyer, a Southern lawyer, you know, and right. but he loved fantasy and he loved horror uh, in the sense that like he liked the classics and he started me out watching like, uh, I remember, I remember one weekend, he's like, when we first got a Betamax, he's like, so I'm sit down, uh, I'm going to show you a movie. And uh, it was uh, Bella Lugosi's, um, you know, Dracula. Nice. And then right after it, he goes, all right, now, if you're scared, he put in Abbott and Costello meet Dracula or whatever that one was, <laughs> you know, and we, and we watched both of those. Like, and I was like, that was it. And I was maybe six or seven. Like he took me to see Jaws in the theater. Wow. You know, and I did not swim that summer. Like I would be in a swimming pool and think like, like the sharks going to get me, even though I could look around, there's no sharks, uh, but that sort of fucked me over. But yeah. Um, so he did a few inappropriate things, but he always sort of, uh, um uh for, like oh and then he read me the hobbit aloud like oh wow and and, and so really the, i mean you can you can i can pretty much just say the most formative influences on my my life when it comes to literature is dracula and the hobbit and lord of the rings mm. and i can just point to like right like right here is uh, uh a line of cut of um uh, uh, Frodo and um, hiding, you know, from the ring race. Nice on the ring, uh, and you know, I've got there's Nosferatu right there, and I, you know, like, like my like sorry, the clear been, line I'm, between I'm, all your stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and and it's it's like like I am in love with horror and fantasy. I really don't think there's any difference between them, uh, honestly. I, I just think that's mark, marketing genre because mm. I think uh, like Lord of the Rings have like serious horror notes. Yep. And I think, um, like, you know, all, all fiction is fantasy. Um, like, it's just, you know, we're just dreaming and trying to share our bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. our, our lies that, you know, try to hit a, a deeper truth. But, um, yeah, um, so that's that's how I really got into science fiction fantasy. You know, and I discovered after that, I was like, how can I get more of this shit? You know, like, how can I get... And, I, you know, I was a, uh, I was a, what they also call a latchkey kid in America, which is like... Both my parents worked. I would come home from school and they would be gone. All right. And I would have like three or four hours where I would just be, uh, you know, we walk. I walked or rode my bike very much um, 1980s sort of, you know, Stranger Things kid stuff. They get that shit right. Yeah, they and, did. <laughs> um, um, and um, I would come home and often I would just sort of like put my book bag down, empty it, um, and then... Uh, because I was, I was going to ride to the library, my local library, and I would get, uh, you know, I would go there. And at the time, like now library, every library has like audiobooks and albums and videos and comic books. But when I was growing up, they don't just had books. Right? Was you it. it was just like, book. you know, you're going to yep. go get a book. And I would go and I discovered, uh, so the other big influence was a John Belair's. Uh, and I, I don't know if you know who John Belair's is, but um, he wrote, this sort of a middle grade horror fantasy book um the face in the frost and then he he followed it up with uh, uh that was a fantasy and then he followed it up with a book called uh, uh, the house of the clock in its walls and it had a um a cover art by edward gory okay. and i don't know if you know who edward gory is but he's a famous uh artist and he did like uh, it was like mystery theater um, in America okay. on PC. yeah yeah it would air when I was growing up there were four channels there was ABC NBC and CBS and there was PBS public broadcast and it, on the weekends they would have um, 
miss they, they would play one episode of doctor who occasionally <laughs> and, and then they'd play like some weird cooking show and they'd have bob ross or whatever but then they'd have um mystery theater and it had edward gory sort of intro that was an animation based on his illustrations right and i saw it and i, and I was like that's the, i didn't know who he was at the time but that's the same guy who you know and so i, I went i got the book just for the cover mm. um because it was great but it turned out to be like my jam and um i uh yeah i loved i loved uh john Belair's, and i still do um yeah, so that, that was really sort of my intro. And I didn't really start trying to write until I was 38. Really? I thought that was my next question. So what you know, what made you suddenly decide one day, I, I'm gonna give this a go? Was it was it can, is this thing you can remember? Or was it just you kind of got to the point where you thought, I'd like to try? Oh no, no, I totally know. Actually, I, that was a lie. I, it wasn't a lie, it was sort <laughs> of like a, it was just sort of a mistruth in the sense that I never really seriously tried to write. Okay. When I was in I, like when I was in college, I say I have a, a, a bachelor's in arts in English. Right. So I was big. I was big into um, I was big into Southern literature, and at the time I was trying. Like at the time I was like, I'm a grown up now. I'm in college, and <clears throat> I'm, I'm not about fantasy books and all this. Like Stephen King. Like I and I was like more about like cr like learning about crime novels and. Mm. And in Southern literature, and like William, I was big into William Faulkner, oh, big into yeah. like 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 John Donne and Shakespeare, and all the shit I was learning in college. Like I was just sort of sucking it in, by being like, I'm fancy, and you know, <laughs> give, let me give me a sweater with some patches on the elbows yeah. and shit, you know. Yeah. You know like, um, so, uh, and you know, it's funny because just yesterday I had I literally just had. Uh, coffee with my uh, college professor, my favorite college professor, a man named Dr. Terrell Tebbets, who kind of really was like the guy who made my sort of love of Faulkner solidify. He's like, oh, he's like a world-known Faulkner scholar. Like he, he he goes and gives like you know paper readings everywhere. Anyway, he taught me in college, and so like he's we still keep keep up. And he like brought my book. He's like we read it, and he discussed my book. And he's like <laughs> now, awesome. and he. And he, he like, he brought out a sheet of paper. He's like, here's all your Faulkner references. And here's all your other references. I'm like, God damn, that was good, man. <laughs> like, you like, did your homework. <laughs> and, then he, and then he goes, I give you a B plus. <laughs> and I was like, come on, man. And he's like, it's been years, come right. on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so uh, back then I wrote a series of stories about a family, very faulkner -esque, about a family in, Ar in Eastern Arkansas who um but it was it was very much in, inspired also like by um you know uh, chandler and um you know the crime writers of the time uh about a family that raised dogs for fighting and sort of like it was it was very you know in the shadow of mount faulkner right like, you know i've brought them out and look and looked at them re and revisit them and i'm like yeah man that was like a kid right you know like writing stuff and then, I, then I'm like, yeah, but there's, I guess, read books like today that aren't that much better. I just didn't, I just didn't, like, it, it just didn't have enough auctorial uh, style. Like, it didn't have my personal stamp on it. It was too yeah. imitative. And, I, and also, I just hadn't lived enough. I, like, I, I didn't have enough uh, emotional empathy for people at the time when I was writing to sort of, like, do characters. So, mm. so I did, I, I tried to write, I even went to a Bennington Writers Workshop. Bennington is like, like the fanciest school and um, the fanciest college in America. It's like, it, well, at the time it was the most expensive. I went right. there for, for a month long workshop when I was 21 and studied with, uh, and studied with two people, one guy named Dana Joya and the other guy named Arturo Vivante. And Arturo Vivante was an Italian doctor who, um, who wrote just beautiful, delicate stories. They're, they're fucking amazing. Not, not many Americans have read them, but he wrote them in English. And he's like, it, it's, he's a very esoteric little guy that a lot of people won't hear about. He's dead now, but he was great. And then Dana Joya was, is a poet. And I'm not gonna say anything bad about him, but he like he used to head the national endowment of the arts in america mm. but he he i i did not vibe with him and okay. um 
but that's and then Barry Hanna was there and I don't know if Barry Hanna is a great southern writer uh John Irving came for a weekend uh I don't know if you know John Irving but that was sort of like my intro to to literature yeah uh, no, I, you know, I'm saying that now and I'm like no I did go to like a convention when I was 12 <laughs> and Larry Niven was there but like this is the first time I actually had like real interaction with writers yeah and how fucking you know crazy they they are and and, and um but uh but then that sort of went away and I got more into music and I try to I, I I really would say that I became a uh narrative writer once I became a decent songwriter okay yeah because you're a so, musician as well yeah and I'm not a great like I'm not a great musician I'm not a great songwriter but the, once I started writing songs that resonated with people and they would ask for them and they would, they would like they knew them and they could sing the, the chorus with me or, or like you know like it, it gave me kind of the confidence to be like you know what I can I can tell a story like I yeah. can do it in song form and then so I was like I was 37 right and I was working at this company uh oh this is a fucking story in itself but um <laughs> I, 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 I was working for this company that was owned by a commune okay <laughs> this <is a> <laughs> um, wow this is a fucking this is a fucking and everyone outside of it I, I it, it, it is a commune but, but everyone in our town calls it a cult all right <laughs> it, it is but and it, I, don't, I don't fucking know but they're good people i, I don't okay. want to bag on them i still hang out with some of them they're good people and and i you know whatever whatever there's a million ways to live life in the sure. world and but it was like it was a group of people that own a like own and still do a block and they have like an internet service providing company in arkansas and they do websites and i was working there and it just wasn't creative like i, yeah. I i've you know the, the only thing i ever wanted to do all through my life is like how do i be creative in my life like and so i became I'm like i'm an art director i do animation i do you know video and i do you know i i do visual arts and audio and vi video but i also write <clears throat> um and at the time, I love those people, but and they tried to be creative, but they just something about their control. They had to have control. The commune people had to have control, and they like, so it just wasn't creative, and it was stymieing me. And I was sort of like, I literally was walking around and was like, "What can I do?" Like, and I, 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 at the time, I was reading five books a week. Wow! Like, I mean, like you know, at the time, I could still read. I, I mean, I could like really read, like because they, like i didn't have a smartphone i had no devices I, there was tv but it was like it was like like this is like 2007 mm. you know i think netflix just started streaming but at the time we had it was we had a netflix account and they sent us two dvds in the mail you, you know what i'm saying yeah, I mean, yeah like, like blockbuster kind of in the mail yeah and yeah and blockbuster had, was still around like they were still like we would go still rent and it was just dvds instead of VC, vhs's yeah yeah we but, do um um and um i was at barnes and noble and sort of walking around uh looking for a book and then i walked back in the section with all the sort of self-help bullshit and like how-to bullshit and and i saw um uh i saw no plot no problem uh, a high speed i can't remember the it's by chris Beatty, b-a-t-y the guy who invented national novel writing month and it's a very slim very small book and it just uh it, it, it i read it and it was like and it turned out it was like october 15th and right. uh, uh it, it, like when i bought it yeah and i read it like that night and i was like oh shit and and it was you know it just talked about how, like when you create quickly when you actually generate shit quickly you access parts of your brain that you really don't when you're being, being very measured it's sort of like kind of the bicameral mind type um, dialogue which I don't know if I buy into all of it but I do know that when I'm really cranking and I'm not thinking about stuff I get to places I rarely do when I'm like laboring and yeah. sort of mired down in the muck you know. Uh, and so uh, I came up, I was like, you know, I've been thinking about all these things. I've been, I've been reading a ton of like hard boiled noir crime novels, but I'd also been, you know, I'd also been sort of revisiting my love of uh, music. So it's the South. And I, and I just took all those ideas and I got in, did the National Novel Writing Month and wrote 50,000 words 
of Southern Gods. And mm-hmm. so the first, actually it was like 60,000, the first 60,000 words I wrote. And then I fit like the next four months, I finished it. And then I, I went and I went to this thing called Borderlands Press Boot Camp. I took it. And, and it's one of those things that I, I always am a little bit uh, hesitant about talking about it because, you know, uh, to do shit like that, to do shit like I've done in my life requires a level of affluence that a lot of people don't have. And I feel very privileged to just say like, you know, uh, but I'm not like some rich guy, but, mm. you know, I just made it my... Like I, I, I like I talked to my wife about it and I just said, like, this is something I want to do. Do you support me to do that? You know, and and w- yeah, we were like, how do we make that happen? And like, you know, yeah. and so um I went to Borderlands Press Pre Camp and and workshopped it. And honestly, I got there and um there it was like there's two tracks. There's a novel, there was a novel track and a short story track. And um Like, of the 30 people in the novel track, I was, me and one other person had, were the only people who had completed the novel, like, have a complete manuscript. Right. And, and, and our deal was you had to read everyone else's 50, like, the first 50 pages. And, and I just, like, honestly, after reading about 10 of them, and I didn't, like, at the time, like, I didn't know about the industry. I didn't know, like, about the slush readers. I didn't know, like, I didn't know all the shit. I was like, man, I'm paying money to go here. I am not going to read all these, this shit. This is just crap. Like, like, you know, and, and I kind of fucked up when I did that because there were some good writers that have come out that were there that I just didn't, I couldn't get to their shit because of all the, the bullshit that, that came in front of theirs. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how it happened. And then, um, and then right after I workshopped that, I realized, I know it's, I, I, well, this sounds very egotistical, and writing as an author is a weird, weird profession because you have to have, like, when you're writing it, it's like you have to have this kind of extreme egotism. Like, mm-hmm. like my, I'm going to add my voice to the chorus of all these storytellers that came before. And, 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 you know, like, and you have to have, you have, sort of have to have that swagger coming into a book to get through it. To, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But yeah, then yeah. you have to sort of, you have to discard all that you know, you have to, you have to clear that, that off and sort of walk into the house of publishing with humility and great deference. So it's, it's like this pendulum swing, like I'm the fucking, I'm a, I'm the fucking dick. And then I'm like, I'm just, a, I'm then just they kneecap and, you. They absolutely kneecap yeah. you and bring you back down to size. And then they build you back up again. And then they release yeah. you on, on publication day. And you're like, yes. And then all the reviews come in and they beat you down again. And then the readers lift you back up. And it's, it is this constant pendulum swing of just being, I feel good about this. And then someone does your head in and then you, you feel good again. And it's just, it's constant peaks and troughs the entire time. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway, yeah. So uh, after I did that Borderlands Press Boot Camp, I was like, uh, this is part of the ego thing. I was like, I fucking know just as well as you people. Like, I, I was like, I, I know... <laughs> like you you guys are like acting like you have the secret and you can tell me but you don't fucking know like i was like <laughs> after, after reading all this shit and then reading like the, some of the prof- like the people who are teaching books i was like yeah man i mean look i might not know all the answers but i know as well as you do like that was that was like my uh, sort of thing coming out of it and i made a mistake and i have met, continued to make mistakes about the things i say and i wrote like a blog post that said pretty much that and i, I like you know, and it was like at the time I was like more into like blogging and sh- bullshit like that because you thought like you know you, that was the things you were supposed to have. You know, and now you know like and now it's like you have to have a video channel or something. You know? <laughs> hey, l- listen, <laughs> I, you know, like hey man, listen, I'm I'm about I just bought like a little stabilizer for my camera because I'm like every day I walk and I I walk an hour and I'm usually listening to audiobook and I have thoughts and I'm just gonna start like recording my thoughts over the whole over the whole fucking time I do an audiobook and once I'm going to, I'm going to edit the little videos and it's, I'm going to call it walk and talk. Yep. And then like, and I'm going to start because the book I'm reading right now is called the book of accidents by Chuck Wendig. And that's the one I'm going to start with. Mm-hmm. So I'm having thoughts and I'm really enjoying it. If I don't like the book, I'm not going to review it because God damn it. You don't need it. No, no one needs any bad press. And look, no. I don't, like, I don't care. It's like, 
I'm, I, I tried listening to a book by the people were telling me it's a classic horror story. I'm not going to name it. And it just wasn't for me. But it mm. doesn't mean it's not a great book. It just it wasn't for me. And yeah. Yeah. I, and like, I'm just I'm not going to put that bad energy out in the world. Uh, I, you know, like like author, everyone's struggling. <laughs> you know, they, no one yeah. needs a fucking bad review. And I understand no. like people can get paid for it. But um, yeah, even though I have said some shitty things about Border and Trust, but you know, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's good. Why not? Know. Why not release it? I mean, Christian Cameron does his uh, uh, writing fighting, like two minute things on Twitter, where he teaches people how to fight with different weapons because that's that's his thing. That's what yeah. he knows, and he loves it, and it's great. So yeah. you know, do it. Why not? You know, write, write, writing and walking and talking, that's... walking and talk. That's it's just going to be me, sort mm -hmm. of with the camera, huffing and puffing and sweating. <laughs> I, I, you got and, and bear got taken for a walk as well well normally bear so bear is like bear is 12 years old oh so my walk with bear is like truncated i have a little loop i do and i come back to the house and drop him off and then i go for my sort of like big walk um <laughs> so but i have to sort of do it in about one hour at lunchtime mm. you know before i have to get back to the desk and, and uh, yeah Work, work for for the slave the slaves day job uh yeah 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 it's a day job stuff if we talk about cosmic horror because i know it's played a role in many of your your books but my knowledge is kind of limited of it i mean i i didn't read any lovecraft until i was like 30 it just it, like it wasn't in a local library it wasn't in the school library it wasn't in my town library and i found it when i was about 30 and i started reading it and i was like oh god this is totally different and totally weird and I, I know there are problems with Lovecraft the man I mean yeah. but who else it, it, you know should I be reading work. um did he, invent, say, uh, did he invent cosmic horror I don't think so I think okay. honestly honestly uh, you know that's it's an interesting question but honestly I think all horror and a lot of fiction that deals with sort of this, the insignificance of mankind and sort of the face of nature. Mm. Like, like I would say that, you know, Jack London is a, is a cosmic horror writer, like to build a fire. If you've ever read that is a story of cosmic horror because it's just a guy trying to build a fire in a snowstorm. And it is like overwhelmingly, um, you know, desperate and like the, his insignificance in the face of this is just, it's like, you know, it's just, you know, it, it taps into this sort of like, you know, there are people um, who can look up at the sky, be in, the, be in a forest and look up at the sky and think I am communing and sort of this aspirational connection with everything. Mm. But there, there are other people who have that same experience and think, oh my, like, what is going on? Like, like, like I live in a harsh universe that has no care for me mm. and how tiny am i and it's like we we just like are we're pretending that we we matter like it's like you know th that's our sort of you know uh moment of you know fretting on the stage um anyway um so yeah i, I don't know if i got into it through lovecraft i kind of sort of fell in back, back ass backwards into um cosmic horror through like stephen king because stephen king was like influenced by lovecraft oh god yeah uh, yeah and then, um, and then, uh, I don't, I don't really, you know, it's God, it's so long ago. Mm. I, I do remember at some point, um, I did, uh, um, have these sort of, there were these black books, little tiny paperbacks. I have someone, some, 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 somewhere in the house we moved and I still haven't two years ago and I still can't find any books I, I want to talk about, <laughs> but, um, um that had this one big gigantic piece of art they used for all these little series like at the mountain of, of madness and it was very much black and white with red um with red like eyes and, right. and like you know like a multi-eyed thing yeah um uh so i i bought those in red that was my first introduction to lovecraft and it was like maybe i was 16 or 17 and then at the same time i was reading um you know like uh uh, Michael McDowell's Blackwater series, which I think is, you know, like I was a very, very much a paperback reader. Yeah. You know, used, there was a used paperback store. So it was very much catch as catch can and, and in the library. And the library didn't carry a lot of horror. It carried like uh -huh. more traditional stuff. So, um, 
that's when I started really sort of going out and walking to books, like used bookstores. Um, uh, so I, I kind of got into uh, ask backwards. I, I'm not, a lot of people, because I've been labeled as a cosmic horror writer, a lot of people think I'm like some, well, let's say this. Um, people who play Call of Cthulhu, which I've never played before in my life, have this sort of lexiconic knowledge of um, like the monsters yeah. and the and the gods and like their lore and their sort of I don't have I don't I didn't I don't have that so yeah. I, I I just I just play with the things I like in that in that sort of a uh, Lego set and mm. I don't you know I don't I'm not like the super uber cosmic horror guy I mean it's it's what I've gotten sort of labeled with and I'm I'm cool with that you know I'm I'm fine but I you know I do other stuff but it all sort of it does uh cosmic horror does appeal to me because it does sort of appeal to my natural dour um <laughs> like I, I am one person when i'm talking to you and i'm hung over from going out the night before and you know i'm jubilant and whatever i had a margarita at lunch but when i'm like you know when i'm serious and sitting down at my desk and, and you know trying to write my books i tend to have a more <laughs> a more desperate and puny sort of <laughs> vision of existence. And um, um, yeah, so, I mean, that, it does appeal to me like that. So it all sort of ekes into what I write. Yeah. Um, but I, I would say that like, if I was talking about like modern writers that I like that do it, mm. that appeal to me more, is yeah. like Caitlin, Caitlin R. Kiernan. Okay. She, she's, she's amazing. Uh, Laird Barron, uh, John Langan. Um, you know, those are the, you know those are the guys who just are really, uh, as the kids say, killing it. Mm. Um, yeah, I I think back to when the era when you know Lovecraft was, well, when he was a young man and writing, and it's it's so weird to try and think about the people that he was essentially pen pals with and just hanging out with that we just don't we don't really have that these days because obviously there's so many writers all over the world and they're everywhere. But back then he was hanging out and writing letters to like. Heinlein and Harry Houdini and Robert Bloch and things and it it just yeah. it just shows how different a world it was back then uh yeah it, it's another reason why like I you know I shouldn't you know I you know my mom is a very southern uh lady she's like you know I, if I heard don't say don't say anything like don't I'm like uh, what's this phrase we, we, like if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Yeah. Um, uh, my mom was very lucky. She, she told me that many, many times. She also would always say, um, <laughs> the, the, the impression you make on the first day of school is the impression that will follow you through the whole school year. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, uh, so um, I, I really should do that more. You know, like I'm about to say something uh, it, like uh, Lovecraft, uh, you know, I've gone through his stuff because you kind of have to, but he's he kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> and also, he you know he had a correspondence I think with Robert Howard. Yes, Robert E. Howard. Yes, uh, and, and honestly, I love the Conan movies and I love the Conan comic books growing up. But I tried reading co the Conan books, mm. and I was just like, this is crap. <laughs> how the fuck can anyone like this i mean it's just like it's just terrible <laughs> like i mean i get it like granted i'm a person you know 70 years 80 i don't fucking know how long I, like distance from that time yeah. culture you know and like i imagine if if in the 20s this shit was coming out in the 20s and all you had really was like like written word like like we're we have a deluge of of content always yeah. like like whatever your fucking kink your your jam is that however esoteric and you figure it out in your life there's people fucking producing that oh yeah pump in your face the pump in your eyeballs and your ears and your what all your orifices and um but back then it was like a dearth like it was a desert and occasionally there you know there are these little oases and that's why like people like fucking you know hp lovecraft and you know at robert howard and like Ro robert block and all these people you know sort of got connected because there wasn't like it's like oh you're a weirdo like me you know let's like let's talk you, yeah. you know and um but now it's like everyone's a weirdo you know 
And you can Whenever find your, your cult easily, your clan. Yeah. You can find it. Yeah. Anywhere in the world, the internet makes it possible to find whatever your stuff you like and whoever likes that stuff that you like, you can find them, you can talk to them. It's so easy That's now. That's right. Yeah. So it's like, um, you know, uh, if everyone's a weirdo, no one is. Um, mm. and just like if, if, if no one is beautiful, you know, if everyone is, um, you know, and what, what did uh, Andy Warhol say? I always, or I always, I'm not trying to like quote people and I'm garbling it, but anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But like, so yeah, Cosmic Horror. Yeah, it's like you growing up though. We had like four channels, and the only thing I had apart from costume dramas and soap operas, which I don't like and watch, was one episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation once a week. And if you didn't watch it, there's no repeats. We had VCRs, but I, they, they they weren't great. If you didn't watch it, that that was it. You didn't get anything else for another week. So it like it was just like this oasis in a bit of Star Trek, occasionally some Doctor Who. And that was that was nothing. We didn't get many TV shows from America until later on, and it was just it was harsh. So yeah, I can imagine back then these weirdos finding each other and writing to each other, and like yeah. everyone else is writing all this serious literature, and they're writing about guys with swords and monsters from space coming to eat your face off. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, those guys are going to search each other out, like you know, um, mm. or you know, uh, yeah. It's, it was a different time. I like you can't. I can't forgive them for the shitty writing. Like, like I'm just like you know. Like, granted, millions of people like that shit. Fun. That's like I don't like really Brussels sprouts. I don't like them. <laughs> like I, I've eaten them a thousand times because my wife likes them, and I don't, I need the fucking nutri nutrients. But I just like you know. I'm not gonna go hunt down some fucking Brussels sprouts and um, uh, you know, to yeah. each his own. Yeah. So tell me about a lush and seething hell because I've read it and uh, where where did this come from? Uh, honestly, it came from I was writing what I call my big haunted historical novel. Mm -hmm. That was it's sort of like this. Um, I kind of was half-assing, sort of thinking I was just going to write a literary novel and like under a different name, and maybe my agent could sell it. <laughs> but then I was like. Uh, I don't really like this. Like, I, I mean, I, I like the the story. I like the time, which is set in uh, the Great Flood of 1927 in the South, which affected. Well, actually, I, honestly, you can't understand the American South if you don't understand the Great Flood, right? And 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 like how that sort of solidified a lot of the sort of class structure that goes on here, um, and it, it really sort of calcified sort of the disparities in economic you know, uh, stratification. Um, and I was wanting to write sort of a book that sort of exploded and explored that in, in a way about a serial killer. And I did tons of research on it. Uh, but because it what didn't have any of my like, I like speculative fiction. I like spooky shit. I like ghosts. I like fantasy. I like like the, the, the weird liminal space between that that world and our world and like like what the characters have to deal with sort of come to grips with that i just that's that's like you know the core of my literary dna is dracula and lord of the rings like so i you know you know i've added to it over the years but like those two things are very much like always at play you know, yeah. fighting um and um but it, so it wasn't working for me. I wrote about 60,000 words on it and it just wasn't working. And I was like, fuck this. I'm going to put it aside. It was, a, it was January of 2018. Mm. And I, I, I was like, I had this idea for, um, uh, God, there's so much bullshit I have to go through to get to this. But um, mm -hmm. uh, like one of the things I always hated, like one of the reasons I stopped reading Stephen King, I don't hate him. I love Stephen King. Like he's a big influence on me. But I did stop reading him for a while because I just got tired of him uh, reading books about him writing about writers. And honestly, I, I, um, I always was like, you know, like you're a writer, use your imagination, go research someone else doing another job, like do a different character. He's done that. Like he has done that. So give him kudos. But at the time, most of his books were like writers as protagonists. Yeah. And I, at some point I, I just said like, um, you know, if you're a writer, don't write a fucking book about a writer. 
And then I was like, I had this idea for a story, but with, with a book about a writer. And, <laughs> and, um, and I was like, okay, if I want to do this, God damn it. It's like, I write a lot of historical fiction and I read books that are set in modern day. And I'm like, oh shit, you don't have to do any fucking research, man. Like you just write about getting a text and like what's on TV. And like, it's just like, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm sort of all over the place. But I, when it, that sort of, when I wrote The Sea Dreams It Is a Sky, I wrote it in like, it was going to be a novella. I was like, I'm going to write a novella. I had been reading like a bunch of tours novellas. And I was like, this is, this is the perfect form for today's reader because it's short. It's like, you can read it in one sitting. It's just like for the, for the attention deficit, it's perfect for the, you know, attention <laughs> deficit world that we live in a little yeah. bit now where, where, where we have to check Twitter or whatever all the time. Now I'm a, I'm a slave to the phone. I'm a slave to the computer. I, I, I am totally that guy. Um, and so I was like, yeah, so I have to bring it in under 40,000 words. And I've got this idea about, I've been reading a lot of South American writers and really was like just inspired and sort of horrified by all the things I was learning about the Pinochet regime, which, which you know, millions of people know all about that. But I was like discovering it. And I was like, oh my God, do you guys know about, about what happened? <laughs> you know, like like the, the hubris of Americans, like, you know, like the only thing that really matters is like what's going on with our bullshit. It, it, anyway, and, um, you know, <laughs> so I was very much inspired by, um, all that and i um i wrote it in like 25 days i just fucking i sat down i started it like in the, the dead week between um christmas and um new year's and it was done by january 22nd i think and i sent it i was like i polished it i spent I like people like sit on shit like i'm gonna sit on this for three months and then i'm gonna come back and revisit it i'm gonna print it out i'm gonna read it aloud and i'm gonna do all this shit i no nah, man i i think <laughs> I, I, I think i uh i think i read through it and i just like i did a spell check and i corrected stuff I, my only thing i do is occasionally i will uh change the font because whatever font you're writing it in yeah uh, it has a visual sort of cadence and if you change the font you'll read it sort of a new way mm. so I, I i did that and then uh, I sent it to my agent and I was like, listen, I, 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 you know, I have some relationships with some small publishers. I didn't say this to her, but I have some relationships with some small publishers. I, I'm pretty sure I could just send it to them and say like, would you like to publish this? And they would go, yeah, we'll do it. And there wouldn't be an advance, you know, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't be anything. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I didn't know how much my, my dream was to get Tor to publish it. Like, I, like, because like I've been reading tour stuff, I still never published a tour. I was like, but my dream was like, I, I would just be like, well, I said to her, I don't know if you want to represent this. I don't know how big of a market it is. I you said, know. I said, um, uh, and I also I think I sent Marcus at the glance uh, um, an email saying, hey, do you guys do any novellas? And he goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no. Um, okay. <laughs> and. Uh, um, because at, at the time I still had some cachet with them, <laughs> they don't they don't pick up the phone anymore. But um, uh, so um, uh, yeah, I sent it. I sent it to her, and I was, I was like, "Do you want to rep represent this?" And she's like, "She read it." She's like, "Yeah, I, yeah." And so uh, one month later, we had three offers um, nice. on, on it, and one was from Tor. <laughs> mm. But uh, but um. I mean, all three of them were great publishers that, uh, and, and, you know, I just would die to have been with any of them. But the one that offered and wanted the bigger deal and wanted something bigger and better was Harper. Um, yeah. uh, and so uh, we went with that. And so uh, it kind of was a wonky book deal in the sense that um, they were like, okay, uh, but we want another story to go with it. Okay and we'll release it in hardback that was a big draw for me um because i'd only had a few hardback releases some of my some, you know some of my early books I just, they were all paperbacks um and um uh and so they released it as an ebook first that one thing and then one one year later it came out with the do you know the duology yeah but and that's when i wrote my heart struck sorrow um uh and i wrote that real fast too 
because um, it, 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 it totally, like I constructed it to totally fit with the sea dreams of the sky in a sense, like in, in oh, let me preface this by saying, I think in that period, that's probably the best thing I've ever written so far to date. Okay. In the sense that I was at the height of my, or I, I, you know, of my writing ability. I had nine books behind me, a, a smattering of short stories, um, you, you know, and I, I was just sort of in, like, I, I think I found my voice. I found the way to write that works for me. Yeah. And, and I constructed both the stories to mirror each other and kind of like so each story has a is, it has a framing story it has an interior story and there's often little other stories in, inside of there mm -hmm. each story like the framing story often has a meta conversation about what's going on in the interior stories the meta the the larger framing stories both have um writers and academics and musicologists like the, the people i said i would never talk like i wouldn't write about <laughs> has them as protagonists yeah and often the people they're talking about are the same. So there's there's a lot of dialogue about art. It's, mm. there, like both of those stories are a, a conversation about art in, in various ways. Yeah. Um, and um, I think, I, you know, everyone is always like, it's weird because people are like, I have a problem with like people will, will, will be like, um, I read this this collection of short stories and there was one good story and, and I didn't really like all of them, but the one good story is great. I just fucking loved it. Two stars. Like, the, you know, and, and like my thing is like, listen, man, if you watch a fucking movie and there's one great moment that really sort of engenders emotion in you, mm. that's a fucking five star fucking experience, motherfucker. <laughs> like, like, like if you take out anything out of some, anything out of life that sticks with you, I'm, anyway, so when people, like, people are always going, you know, I, I didn't really like the first story, but I really like the second story. And I'm just like, man, it's one story. Mm. It's like, you can't really, like, it's easy to parcel them out because they have different, different titles, but it's the same goddamn conversation. Yeah. Like, in, uh, anyway, that's just me, you know, sort of being a little baby. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, so anyway, I'm very proud of it. I, you know, and often I'm just like, wish people would just sort of look at it as a one work. And it, I think it's, um, you know, it hurts it because I didn't really want, one, I didn't really want Cosmic Horror on the, on the cover. I also didn't want two tales. I just wanted it to be a lesson seething hell. And that's yeah. like, you open the book and that's the, it, it, you know, that unfolds. Because it is, they are very much like two pieces of a puzzle that fit. And they came out of me in a time where I was very, just vibrant and like really at the sort of feeling like the height of my powers uh and i think it's probably the best stuff i've ever written um because like now i'm struggling you know the next thing i chose to do is something that i love and i'm fucking jazzed about it but it's like the rigors of the challenge are like bogging me down um because it's, mm -hmm. it's a dracula adjacent historical novel okay so like the, the historical parts but also like sort of tackling Dracula in a way that's like, what am I adding to this? Like he's been fucking riffed on a million times. Like, am I like, you know, and so I'm sort of beleaguered by um, just self-doubt and all the bullshit that we, you know, that, we're, that we are heir to, you know, yeah. as writers. Yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, but at that time, I, I like, the, you know, those two books are, they got me doing it. Bless you seeing the hell is, like I was totally assured when I was writing it. I just like, because it, it came out of me fast and it was like, I wasn't doubting. I wasn't thinking. I wasn't, I had done all the research. I, I had, you know, I had done, I had been researching, like I had been working for years to do these books, to write these books. And it just was like, boom, you know? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the work I'd done, a lot of the research I had done for my big haunted historical novel really made its way into My Heart Struck Sorrow um so you know so i had been doing the work um anyway it was it, so uh, once once more like with the national Novel writing month and this i it's i highly recommend if if a writer ever gets to the point where they're just like feeling super confident and they're fucking they're they just have something that they're passionate about and they're not doubting themselves to ride that as long as you can like like to catch that wave yeah. ride that swell because you know you'll be in a different point in your life a fucking 
a virus will come along and put you in pandemic and suddenly all you can do is think about your own you know fucking bullshit <laughs> and um yeah uh well that's that is the messy uh long version of election season hill mm. well my my t- i think we said this before we start recording but i met you at a uk convention years ago and it was around that time when the incorruptibles i think was coming out and this is your trilogy from uh, from Golans, which so I- I'll say this: there's a lot of fantasy coming out every year. It seems that there are more fantasy than sci-fi books being published, and standing out in the market is difficult because you have to have something familiar but different, and yet they want something yeah. that's different. And I, I'm I'm constantly um, telling people to read your books because they are so different, and you know it's it's fantasy with western elements, with horror elements, and you brought you know the, the, the roman influences to the world so you brought so many different elements again so did you consciously set out to do something different or is it just a case of all of these things that influence you you just want to put them into the book yeah i mean it's kind of like um it, 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 i think i got the idea for the incorruptibles by, by reading larry mcmurtry i was right. in a big i was in a big western um uh, I was reading a bunch of westerns, and mm-hmm. I also was reading. Um, man, I love Elmore Leonard. I love. I, I love. I like. I love crime. Like you know, I, I could easily see myself writing crime at some point. But I just often I, I just go to. I, I like the sort of horror. I like horror more. But yeah, um, I was and I was reading of all his westerns and his westerns. Elmore Leonard, who, who really sort of became more famous for like Get Shorty and all that shit. And he yeah. wrote a bunch of westerns. But his westerns are like, um, they're just crime novels with horses. You know, <laughs> they really are. I mean, it, he's st- it's still Elmore Leonard. Anyway, I was reading that, and then I I had never read oh, fuck um, the Writers of the Purple Sage by what the fuck Zane Gray, I think that's his right. Name. And, I, okay. and it's a classic. It's a classic western. Okay. Um, and I picked it up, and it was just like the first paragraph was like describing the sage and the mountains beyond it and it i was like this is a fantasy novel like like because it was very much like because you know a lot of fantasy is rooted in in nature like it's it's mm-hmm. root, like you know like tolkien is like very much yeah been, you know um and i was like and i continued reading it and it was very like purpley prose ish you know like mm. <laughs> like and then it sort of sort of settled down into its groove and, and you know i was like all right, all right i see what, i see what's going on but i was it was also like i was reading um i'd already been published like when so we can talk about this when you get published it kind of fucks up reading for you or at least for me it, it did i don't know if it's fucked it up for you 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 might have preserved your love of reading but for me becoming a published author has kind of fucked up my love of reading because it is now an industry thing in a in a sort of dissection and mercenary exploration of like what this person is doing right what they're doing wrong like what can i take from this and it, and it rarely like it has to be fucking amazingly good to sort of break down that that kind of aggressive way i read you know what i'm saying like the, yeah um, it's, it's hard to turn that part of your brain off given that it's you know your job uh yeah. so you're trying to not have a critical eye and just enjoy a book can be difficult at times yeah and that, I, I think that's why audiobooks really sort of helped me get back into the love of reading because it when when you're listening to it especially with a good narrator it breaks that down yeah i mean um uh yeah and uh as i was saying before we started recording like um n- nowadays i have a i have an audible subscription and i um you know, I listen to audiobooks, and often when you choose your audiobook, it offers you to get the ebook with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have a Kindle, because uh, also, as I said beforehand, my wife has told me that I can't, I have to limit my physical objects I bring into the house. <laughs> and um, uh, so, um, and I've, I've suddenly fallen fall in love with audiobooks and ebooks because I will go on my walk and listen to the, the audiobook. And then when I get home, as I was saying, I, I don't really like to sit in my house with my cats and my dog and my wife and be listening to an audiobook through headphones because it's very, it's very insular. That, yeah, it is. Uh, and it's different when you're, you're like reading something. So 
I will re- I will read the audio. I will read the ebook when I get home. But the great thing is, is fucking my Kindle knows exactly where I stopped listening. So it picks it up right where I stopped listening. So it's been a real sort of, it's really sort of broken down that wall that I've, I, I have. Um, uh, and, you know, I've listened uh, to, I'm going to do a plug real quick. Go ahead. I, I listened to all of Christopher Buhlman's books. Oh. And uh, Christopher Buhlman wrote The Black Tongue Thief. That's on my he, shelf to read. Uh, mm-hmm. He is, this, this motherfucker... That's on my shelf to read. There you go. It's got. Oh, oh, it's the same art. See, this is the. Okay, that's kind of like the American. Uh, oh, okay. Better. So this is a hardback. Beautiful hardback. This, this is hardback too. Oh, okay. So it's slightly different UK version to US version. Yeah. I think mm. we got it better. I like the black and yellow. <laughs> um, it's pretty good. Anyway, this is this is a tour, of course, fucking tour. But Christopher Buhlman narrates his own books. He is oh, a fucking. Wow. Uh, let me tell you, he is the, a voice actor extraordinaire. Every single character has a different voice, and then he fucking nails it. And he did, and also like he did these. I love a lot of people don't like vampires, but like I said, Dracula and Lord of the Rings, big mm-hmm. things for me. I fucking love vampires, and he did these the, these vampire books that are, are hardcore, fucking wonderful vampire books, The Lesser Dead and the Suicide Motor Club, and he narrated them. And, oh. Anyway. He's my big find. Like, like I love this guy. I, and it's like we. I just did a video talk with him. Uh, the guy is amazing. Anyway, I don't want to fucking suck his dick on TV, but you know, like, um, I, I like I like him a lot. Anyway, that's how I've been sort of like breaking through. Um, um, you know, my my sort of mercenary reading thing is audiobooks. I do read a lot of nonfiction. I don't have the problem with nonfiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm because it's just like. I'm learning. I'm learning to check. I love. I love the kind of the way that in the incorruptibles, you've taken things that are familiar, especially tropes to do with um, like fantasy races, and you've made them completely your own. And the fact that one of the main characters is like a half dwarf, and normally, you, you know, I, we've read fantasy for years, the pair of us, and sometimes you go. I love the Dragonlance books when I was growing up. Reading them now, I think if I went back and read them, I'd struggle. You're like, oh, there's a half elf and a half dwarf, and you go, yeah, okay, this doesn't really mean anything. But when I read sh- Shoes, you re- point of view, you realize there's actually more there. There's weight to the fact that he doesn't belong to either. He's seen so many things change because he's that long lived. He understands mankind because he's a part of them, and yet he's also not. He understands the dwarfs because he's part of them, but he's not. And so he has this really unique perspective on the world. And I love that. You've taken something that's familiar, that's kind of run of the mill and people kind of roll their eyes at, and you made it something different. And the elves in your book, which are just not elves. They're scary. They're weird. They're disturbing. And they're kind of alien. And, you know, I love Tolkien as well. But if I see another elf walking around the woods playing a harp and just being all, oh, I'm, I'm going to yeah. go mad, you know? I want I wanted them to be more like uh, vampires. I wanted I wanted the elves to be like more like sharks. Like they were. Like, They're disturbing, creepy, and weird. Yeah, I, that's what I because I because I feel like uh, so I got I caught some heat because I, I had some people say like I, I was racist on it, and I, I was like I had to point out to folks that, like I wasn't really trying to do like a Native American vamp on it. I was, but but they were like, oh, you you point like you painted the savage Indians. And I was like, well, my narrator is a Native American. These are just like these sort of scary creatures, right? Uh, anyway, uh, that hurt, that kind of hurt me because I worked real hard on trying to like not do that. I have sensitivity readers and all, all that stuff, but um, yeah. Uh, but thank you about shoe. I, I love shoestring. She, like I feel like in retrospect, I didn't know at the time, but you know, I'm 50 now. Um, I was sort of like approach, you know, I was approached, I was 40, I think when, when I wrote that book uh, or 41 or 42. And I was just sort of coming to the, you know, the, I, you know, I was just like, like uh, at the divine comedy. I was just coming to the midpoint of my life, you know, lost in the woods. And um, Shu is very much, I, I, I have had the experience in my life of always feeling like the outsider looking in. Because I, you know, I'm kind of, I'm a nerd in a southern town. I'm, you know, you're a big like, reader in a southern town. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. You get shit you know. for that now. <laughs> I mean, 
but like also you know you're what six six like i'm a big guy but I, i'm not like i'm not like a super aggressive i'm six two i'm not like a super aggressive like all the shit that you would expect a big dude my age to be into and doing i'm just not i'm not into that i don't watch sports i don't you know like like football i don't fucking care like you know like and like i see you know i see people getting in fights at like uh, football games in the uk but yeah, yeah. like baseball games and, and you, i'm like why the fuck do you care that much but you want to fight some other person about like these people who are throwing balls like just mm. just go have a drink and you know, like, <laughs> chill out anyway yeah I, I, you know i i'm just not so i I have always, and often uh, at conventions, I've always felt like I'm part of this, but I'm not really, and I'm like, it's, it's a disconnection, but I want to be, I want to be connected. I want to find my, my connection, but I just don't like, I always feel like the outsider looking in um, Same. because, yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know, I don't know if it's just part of my personality or my like, physique or just my like general, you know, uh, you know, my, my wife says that I, all my emotions are like carried like right here. And like there, I, there's no hiding. Um, so like if, I, if I'm di- nonplussed or displeased or whatever, it's just like, it's or, or, you know, but well, I, like if I'm happy or excited or whatever, it's, you know. Um, so yeah, so she was, I think, a direct reflection of that. Um, shoe I, it's funny i i just realized while we were talking about shoestring um uh yeah that's that's a derogatory nickname like like uh they called him that because he's so small he was like also i don't know if you got it but he's a child of rape um so his like the, the romans or uh, that came in um yeah. his, his mother was like so he you know he has a very conflicted um um you know uh, heritage uh but i wrote a series of young adult novels um uh, the 12 finger boy, boy. conformity the, sh- the shibboleth um who, who i just realized the ca- main character in that is named shree shoe and shree and um they, they're both told in first person narrative mm-hmm. uh and i would say that between shoe and shree is really me like that's when you write in first person narrative, it's yeah. really, um, you're really expressing sort of, you are sort of dipping your hand into the hot cauldron of your psyche, uh, you know, and sort of dredging up, um, you know, burning yourself in the process, but dredging up all like whatever bullshit that you, you know, you have problems with, uh, you know, all the, uh, all your little butt hurts growing up and, mm-hmm. you know, everything. Um, listen, I don't take myself very seriously. I try not to take myself very seriously <laughs> because because I do take myself too seriously. When I'm like, well, you, you know, what I'm saying, like, I, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be told that too. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I try not to be precious about it, but um, but then I'm precious about it. They were they were good books. I like them because well, they're different. Thank you. I like them because they're unique, and you know, you did something different that I'd not seen before, and you know we get a lot of good good fantasy books and sometimes it's just same old same old and sometimes it's interesting and different so i'm always happy to shout out what's uh you know different from the norm well thank you so much i fucking love your battle mage books man those i also listened to those and, and read them <laughs> read those too. that's another, another book I, I i bought them twice man you should everyone should buy books twice <laughs> The narrator's a great guy. He's a, he's a theatre actor over here in the UK and we talk through stuff and and this is a minor spoiler, but you've read it already. There's kind of um, cosmic horror stuff in that first book and in, in, in all yeah. of the books, uh, creeping in around the edges. So there again, I, I've been influenced by Stephen King and Lovecraft and and other stuff and it, and it just creeps in and, and it's, it's there and like the third book in this series is basically a horror novel. I basically cheated on my yeah. first trilogy. The first one's a war book. The second one's a crime book. The third one's a horror book with things that, that are creeping around the edges. So yeah, I, fantasy is a massive cheat code. It's just an umbrella that you can yeah. use to write any kind of story that you want. Well, I love you know honestly the the battle mage one at the time I was reading because I want like the title I, I wanted to read like a big battley thing, mm. but and I was like oh I was interested in because uh, at the time I was. Um, uh, 
running a game and I was sort of, I'm, I've been doing a lot of pre-pro on um, a fantasy novel, another fantasy novel. Yeah. And, and th- that is like high magic because uh, the Incorruptibles is low as a low magic setting. Yes. Really. Um, uh, and I wanted to do, explore like something like more, more China, China Mieville sort of like crazy mm. out, out of control, you know, magic. But I, I was also really wanting some battle. And when I read uh, Battle Mage, listened to and read to read Battle Mage, I was amazed at uh, because that was one of the things I really struggled with in doing the battle scenes in uh, in um, the Incorruptible series. I just I, I, like if I if I could go back, you know, I, I just don't know if I did those as well as I could because I just don't. Anyway, but I was reading yours and I was like, God damn, I was in, I was in it. I was like, this is a fucking movie. Like I, I was, um, I could see everything perfectly. Uh, it was like, I was like, this guy's, this guy's hitting it on all cylinders. Um, anyway, I, I love those books. Uh, and I, I need to read the next three. Are they <laughs> the next three in the same, in the same world? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, first oh, trilogy, sec- so I did the first trilogy with Orbit. And then they did well enough that they said do a second trilogy, and, and the second trilogy picks up ten years later. So there's like repercussions of stuff that's happened. Oh, hell and the, yeah. the, the yeah. new the new one is not connected at all. It's totally brand new, also, totally separate. So I also need to, I, I need to get that one. I have not. I I apologize. I haven't. That, no, it's yet. okay. It's totally. It's not. It's, I'm not here to plug my books. We're here to talk about you. So it's it's cool. It's cool. Well, I mean, let's plug <laughs> let's plug everything. <laughs> so tell me, what are you what are you reading at the moment? What what's good? Um. Okay, well, I actually did my little preparation okay. uh, for it. I, for sure. I, as I said, Black Tongue Thief. Excellent. Um, I'm, re- I'm listening and reading um, Chuck Wendig's uh, The Book of Accidents, which is, okay. a, is very much like classic Stephen King. It's great. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, uh, I am... Um, also, I bought... I pre-ordered this book. I, probably my favorite novelist and favorite book of the last decade is Wolf Hall, Hillary Mantel. Right. And, yeah. I, and I pre-ordered this book when it came out and got it, right? And lost it. Um, I, and I found it in my, uh, I keep, this is kind of, look, this is sort of shows the Arkansas boy in me, but I have a compartment in my car that I keep a fishing rod, a collapsible fishing rod, okay. and a tackle box. And I just found it like a week ago in the in that, <laughs> that compartment. Um, so I, like this came out like a year ago and I was super excited, but I was like, I gotta find, I'm not gonna buy it again. Like I'm buying books twice, like too many times. Anyway, so I'm reading this. This is great. Um, I have, you know, I have my stack of research for the Dracula adjacent um, book. Um, wow. So Elizabethan underworld, 19th century underworld, Victorian underworld, <laughs> um, vampire classics, um, songs of the valiant voivode and other folk, wow. folk tales. Strange folklore, yeah. Uh, like um, Dacia, an outline of the early civilizations of the carpatho dacian wow. countries and then uh this is just fun a pocket dictionary of the vulgar tongue <laughs> this is just, so i mean the book i'm writing is kind of it's, it's literally a like a crime novel mm-hmm. meets a hammer film okay and, you know um it's it's like it, it is it's literally my sort of concept before it was in have you seen in bruges it's one of my favorite films ever mine, i love mine, that film mine too i love it I, I love how it's you know it was you know how it's marketed as like a black comedy but it's mm-hmm. re- it's very man it's very deep i mean like that that movie is uh hits me actually i didn't like the guy uh what's colin um, colin farrell i didn't yeah i did not like colin Farrell as an actor he irritated me until i saw that movie uh-huh. And then I was like, I was like, holy shit. Like it really, he's it, like, God. yeah, I was like, okay, I, I see where I was wrong on that. Anyway, so my, my pitch for it is really just, it's in British meets Dracula. It's some, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it's some, it is some criminals who commit a terrible crime who go and to hide out, flee to a town called Bistritz in Romania under mm-hmm. the Borga Pass about 20 years before the events of Dracula and become enmeshed in um, sort of Dracula. 
And one of the things I was interested in also, I reread Dracula and I was like, you know what's so fucking dumb about Dracula? Like, I mean, I love it, but you know what's so dumb? And everyone's like, um, everyone's like, oh, he's this sexy, mysterious, super powerful dude. Homeboy is like, he has to drive the coach down and get Jonathan Harker. He's got to like scurry around and sort of act like he's not doing all of these servant roles. Mm-hmm. Um, he has to like cook him dinner and sort of like, you know, like, like he's, he's like, <laughs> he's so he's he's kind of uh you know he's kind of a, just a a weakling like you know and, and on the whole i i like flipping things like vampires on the whole are like dude if you can't come out in the day and you have there are some specific ways we can kill your ass like you're you're a weakling like like that's the reason why I'm, mm. yeah i mean you like you get them in the right situation yeah scary yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but I mean, most of the, you know, the sun's shining most of the time. We can come, you know, anyway. Um, so that's sort of like what I've been riffing on. I, I'm going to go ahead and finish up with the, the stuff. I just got um, Dracula, motherfucker. And <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I know this is like, it starts off in um, Hungary or Romania. Okay. And then, but it goes to like, you know, the 1974 L.A. Okay, it's, probably it's, black exploitation, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it looks fucking fantastic. It looks a little, you know, looks like there's little sex in it, like all vampire shit should have. Um, so I haven't read that yet, but it's fucking uh, awesome. And then the other thing I want to uh, uh, talk about is, I, all right, before I show this, I'm going to say say this. I I got I was very lucky to get to read this comic. Uh, the author of it sent me a version of it. And okay. It has been so fucking popular it's hard to get this first edition and I had to find a variant cover and I don't want, honestly, I don't want this cover because it is very, um, I don't know. I, I don't like, I don't like covers of things that have a woman on them with their ass pointing to the camera. Right. Like, but it's the only one I could get uh, in town. Okay. okay? So, yeah. so okay. I'm, I'm going to show, I'm going to show it to you. There's better, there's better covers. But it, this is actually uh, a fucking amazing series. And for anyone who likes Conan, it is uh, Conan the Comet. Again, I'm not yeah. the hugest fan of Robert Howard. But it's called Barbaric. And it's by uh, Michael Mor- Morrissey. I think I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He's a yeah, super yeah, yeah. good dude. Mm. Uh, uh, sorry, there's the glare. Yeah, but, I see. Um, it, and and the, this girl is not the main character. She's like but they put her front and her ass front and center right again i don't like this cover mm. but you should find it because it's about this guy who has this axe that is a cursed axe that makes him do the right thing uh, and and so um it, it forces him to for sort of like justice even though he's sort of a conflicted character mm. like uh, he can't tell a lie i mean it's it's it, he's cursed with having to do the right thing but it's super bloody and i I, uh, my, my, uh, one of the things I loved about the Conan comics growing up was there was always someone getting his hand chopped off. Like, <laughs> like usually, you, yeah. You, yeah. It's, just some, it's like, ah, and like the guy with the sword and, and it's float, like it's just embodied and there's a little blood. Um, uh, <laughs> and I, uh, Michael Morrissey, uh, posted like the cover, uh, you should search them out because they're fucking awesome. Um, he posted the cover and I was like, man, I hope there's some hands getting chopped off. <laughs> and he sent me, he sent me the first and, uh, you know, like digitally. And yeah, I read yeah. it. And I was like, yeah, there's some hands getting, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of shit getting <laughs> chopped off in here. And, and the art is amazing. Anyway, and it's very well written and it's lighthearted. And it's like, you would think that it would be super sexist and like terrible, but it's not. It's like, it's a modern, you know, it's, it's sort of a modern, better imagining of Conan. Um, okay. Sounds good. I, I really like it. So that's that's pretty much what I'm I'm, I'm reading. Oh, and I'm reading a poetry, a book, of, one book of poetry. Okay. Which is bright dead things. I don't really know any by Ada Limon. Mm-hmm. I do not know um, really anything about her, but I really like. Um, I feel like you, you should read poetry to sort of get out. Like I'm trying to break down the walls that I build about words. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. But like I've started, um, I started writing screenplays and it makes me, um, you know, it makes me think about it differently. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to, because mm. I'm getting calcified. Like, like I'm getting, I'm getting in ruts and I'm trying to break out of that. 
And... That, yeah, if you do read the same kind of thing, I mean, I do read a lot of fantasy and science fiction, but I do have to read out, outside the genres because otherwise you get kind of blinkered and you don't yeah. get the same feeling and you've got to read and watch. And like, like I, I spoke to Christian Cameron and he said, someone was saying, would you ever teach a writing course? And he said, well, no, because it would be really simple. His course would be like, you, have you traveled anywhere? No, go and travel, learn some stuff, get some life experience and then come back and write stuff. And I think that's what you, you need to do. And sh because, you know, pandemic, the better, better version of that is grab as many weird, different things as you can and try and absorb that. And from that, you'll yeah. get new and different and interesting ideas. I think that's, you know, what you can do if you can't yeah. travel. Yeah, I, I got to say, it, um, there's a whole, because it's so hard to make a, a living as a writer, mm. there's a whole industry of teaching people how to write because that's how people who aren't making a living at writing try to, expand on um and, and that's fine i'm like i don't have any problems with that but ultimately uh if i had to say like like i, I will teach writing because because i i would love the opportunity to like talk about writing because i fucking like talk, I think this is what we do we spend so much time i want to talk about it but the first thing i'll say is listen um uh everyone's process is their own process and i can't teach you how to write all i can tell you is like what i've you know what i've experienced and I can maybe tell you other ways to like look at things, but like there's you, no one can teach you how to write. It's something you have to teach yourself and you yeah. teach yourself by doing. And so ultimately you have to do the work and then that's how you learn. And, you know, and there's no real major answers. That's art. That's the dialogue of artists. Like I, my, my wife's uh, uncle is a world famous visual artist, painter, has shit hanging in the Smithsonian and in, 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 uh, embassies like all over the world yeah uh, he's made his living all his life by only being a painter he lives in a tiny house um he he you know but he is amazing and one of the great things about my relationship with him is when I, we talk about art it's always about the process mm. and it's always it's always about trying to figure out the process and it's always about um it's always about how you know he would say like when i was a young man the process was this and there's things i like about like like we'll look through his paintings that are fucking amazing and be like i like this like i like how i was getting the light in the brush stroke like like and i can't do that anymore but i do it like now it's like this is how i do it now right and, and and it's always like you know i had this misconception when we start like when you write your first book you finish it and you're like i know how to write a book now fuck it but <laughs> done i'm out you know but then the next book comes along and you maybe maybe you got it maybe, maybe it's like boom i got it boom maybe the next one comes along and maybe it's boom i got it but like the longer you write you're gonna hit that book where it's like you got to learn how to write a book again yeah and that is and and that is where you do the hard fucking work of being an artist and and, and uh, there's a lot of people who say like writing is not art it's craft like you're just doing a craft. it is art it's art if you can touch someone's emotions it's art right mm. that fuck you it is art and that is what being an artist is, is um, you're always revisiting your craft. And, and any motherfucker, God, I'm, I'm really sort of cranky. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'm going to tell you something. Any motherfucker who thinks their shit is perfect, like who writes something or, or does a work of music or does a piece of visual art and thinks that's perfect and has no problems with it, they're bullshit. Because, yeah. because because they're not evaluating their process anymore they're not looking back like if you don't come out of any project not being satisfied with it then you will never grow when the point when you are and I, like i said like earlier I, i'm the most proud of um a lesson seething hell yeah and like it like here's the deal with uh, writing here's the deal with any type of art because i've done art in all forms all like for my uh, adult life in mm -hmm. design animation music you have an idea of conception and that's that's an aspirational word cloud of things that that, that um uh, that you that all the things you're gonna do and the, yep. you know just all the hopes and dreams and whatever and then it goes to the fucking colon and it gets shit shit out and there's a long distance between those two things mm. and if you like shit is maybe a month of best metaphor <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the, the the completion of the project is 
um, sometimes it's way away from what you had the idea. Yeah. I just feel like I, while I still have problems with the lush and ceiling hill, I feel like those points were a little bit closer together. I feel mm. like I, I feel like I got closer to the to the bullseye vision of what with, you were doing with what I was trying to do. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and um, anyway, that's sort of my. That would be pretty much every day if I taught, taught a writing class would be pretty much what I would say. <laughs> but then I would say shit, dumb shit too. Like, you know, like I have stupid ideas, like don't write about writers <laughs> or like, you know, uh, like I'm, I am not fucking going to name him because he's a super famous fantasy author and a nice guy. And, but like, I fucking cannot stand like uh, when I read um, books that people they don't just say he said or he she said or he asked or, or he responded and they say stuff like he ejaculated or you know like he he retorted or like they, they come up with all these ways to say like what the person is saying like the dialogue attribution yeah i, I like you know that's one of the things I, like if i taught i would be like i don't like that I, I just don't like it but a lot of people do it and like they're fucking making a lot more money than i am so what the fuck do i <laughs> what do i know I don't, I don't fucking know but yeah i'm not gonna name this person did no. i say a, a sex no I, no i did, no. I did say he, <laughs> he. <laughs> yeah there's a lot of big fancy authors out there you know that's good anyway let me we, I, I bent you in though thank thank you for for talking to me tonight thanks for talking about you know all of this stuff uh it's been a pleasure as always and i hope when covid changes because i don't think it's going anywhere maybe we'll yeah. be a convention again in the future in uh, in person i i really hope so i would love to come back to the uk i um uh, i'd like to i'd like to buy a sailboat and sail over there go to the <laughs> azores sail from sail from here to the azores go mm -hmm. up from there to ireland and then go down the coast of, go over ireland and down the coast of scotland nice and and then come and, and live on my little sailboat and write books and do like playboy <laughs> shit and then go to uh france and go through the canal system in sounds my good. sailboat that sounds amazing yeah. let's do that you come with me? Let's, yeah yeah let's go it. and do that let's go i'll get a boat i'll get a boat with two berths <laughs> okay <laughs> i might only be able to afford one so you have to okay <laughs> okay <laughs> all right guys we'll see you later all right, man. Thank you. Good night, everyone.